The opening lines of the project declare, on the 400th anniversary of this fateful moment, it is finally time to tell our tr- story truthfully. Quote, what if we were to tell you that this fact, which is taught in our schools and unanimously celebrated every 4th of July, is wrong? And that the country's true birth date, the moment uh, its defining contradictions first came into the world, was in late August of 1619. Oh, you mean a uh, hundred plus years before we were a country? When we, the, the country that we tried to get away from, England? Well, what if I told you monkeys lived in my nose? It doesn't make it true. Now, it claims to be like the Lawrence Fishburne character in The Matrix, delivering the truth, offering America the red pill. Like The Matrix, Matrix, it wants to wake you up to the fact that you're, the entire America that you thought you knew was a lie. You're really just plugged into an American system of slavery. That bowl of cereal you ate this morning, evil, because it has sugar in it. Sugar was a slave crop. Lack of universal health care, because of slavery. Overcrowded prisons, low minimum wage. White artists stealing black music. Traffic jams on freeways in Atlanta. I'm not kidding, all of it is because of slavery and segregation. Those aren't jokes. The 1619 Project covers all of those topics and more. Quote, No aspect of the country that would be formed here has been untouched by the years of slavery that followed. The message is simple. America sucks. It stinks on ice. And all of it is built on slavery. They say, quote, the goal of the 1619 Project is to reframe American history by considering what it would mean to regard 1619 as our nation's birth year. Again, monkeys in my nose. Doing so requires us to place the consequences of slavery and the contributions of black Americans at the very center of the story we tell ourselves about who we are as a country, end quote. The 1619 Project is also a podcast. Oh, it's much bigger than that, even. Random House is releasing a series of 1619 books next year. The New York Times even partnered with the Pulitzer Center to indoctrinate students with the curriculum for schools. By the way, it has nothing to do with the Pulitzer Prize. That's another Pulitzer. Normally, a special project like this would quickly fade away. But this is a sustained, coordinated, and very well-financed campaign. The 1619 curriculum is already in thousands of schools across all 50 states. Is it in yours? If it is, you must get it out. It is a very serious effort to brainwash an entire generation of American youth that their nation is a fraud and must be corrected. The leader and public face of the project is Nicole Hannah-Jones, who calls herself the Beyonce of journalism. I don't even understand the world today. I mean, that's a good thing. In, six, in 2016, she established the Ida B. Wells Society for Investigative Reporting, devoted to providing the training and mentorship nation, uh, necessary for journalists of color to compete and succeed. Where'd she get that money? Predictably, her organization got its funding from... Uh, do I even need to say it at this point? The Open Society Foundation... George Soros. In 2008, she received a fellowship from the Institute for Advanced Journalism Studies to travel to Cuba, where she studied Cuba's amazing universal health care and educational systems. In an article titled, The Cuba We Don't Know, she blamed the U.S. for Cuba's low per capita income and crumbling infrastructure. Yet, she wrote, quote, Cuba boasts one of the highest literacy rates in the world, end quote. Gee, I wonder if Bernie Sanders stole that line from her. She continued, Cuba's universal health care system is seen by many as a world model. Really? 
She also said Fidel Castro's regime, quote, led to the end of codified racism and brought universal education and access to jobs to black Cubans. And that Cuba is not the great evil we're led to believe. Oh, of course not. She apparently still is drinking the Cuban Kool-Aid because she told Vox just last year this. If you want to see the most equal uh multiracial, uh, it's not a democracy, (laughs) most equal multiracial country in our hemisphere, it would be Cuba. In places that are truly, um, at least biracial countries, Cuba actually Mm -hmm. has the least inequality. And that's largely due to socialism, which I'm sure no one wants to hear. Uh Uh Yeah, well, it's very equal. Everyone's miserable except at the very top. Now, her romantic feelings about Cuba 12 years ago foreshadowed her approach with the uh, the 1619 Project, which is only socialist revolution can save America. Its legacy of slavery, it will be over if we adopt this philosophy and bring about real justice, like Che, like he did with all of his friends that were not black, not homosexual, and didn't have a differing opinion. As you'll see, that Marxist-friendly sentiment permeates the entire project. Her opening essay sets the tone for the 1619 Project. It is titled, America Wasn't a Democracy Until Black Americans Made It One. She sets the precedent for her bad history skills at the very top with this. Quote, our democracy's founding ideals were false when they were written. Black Americans have fought to make them true. Without this struggle, America would have no democracy at all. Really? No democracy? Well, there might be a few war veterans and various races that might have a differing opinion. Maybe. I mean... I lost a couple of relatives in the Civil War fighting to free slaves. She goes up and says, The United States is a nation founded on both the ideal and a lie. Our Declaration of Independence, approved on July 4, 1776, proclaims all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. But the white men who drafted these words did not believe them to be true. For the hundreds of thousands of black people in their midst. Well, she doesn't mention that three out of the five men uh, on the committee that drafted the Declaration of Independence did not own slaves. Roger Sherman, Benjamin Franklin, and John Adams. What's more, Franklin became the president of the nation's first abolition society. Adams represented slaves suing for their freedom in Massachusetts. 